experts, both local and international, still insist that it will take a lot of good planning and a solid legal regime if this country will actually benefit from this resource, which is limited. The government has responded to these concerns by tabling in Parliament two bills that seek to provide not only the infrastructure for managing oil, but also a legal regime that puts in place a system of checks and balances. In the past, there has been a lot of concern about the lack of transparency in the sector, with many decisions being taken by government and certain developments taking place in the oil fields without the knowledge or the full knowledge of the general public. Many are advising Uganda to join the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative, or EITI, to avoid the standoff with the populace. Now, other demands about sharing the oil uh, money have come up with the Kingdom of Bunyoro Kitara, where the oil is found asking for a share of up to 12.5%. Last year, Uganda took a decision to build an oil refinery within the Bunyoro region, but recent reports have pointed to challenges in acquiring the required land to host this important project. So tonight, we take a look at what is happening now within the sector, and if at all, all the key concerns have been raised and are being addressed by government. Our guests tonight, Honorable Peter Lokeris, Minister of State for Mineral Development. You're most welcome, sir, Honorable Lokeris. Uh, thank you, viewers. Viewers, because we are also on the internet, you can access a spectrum video of YouTube. We're also joined by Mr. <coughs> Fred Kavanda, Principal Geologist at the Petroleum Exploration and Production Department in the same ministry. You're most welcome, Mr. Kavanda. Thank you, Edmund. Good evening, listeners. We're also joined by Mr. Dickens Kamujisha, Executive Director of AFIEGO, that's the African Institute for Energy Governance. It's uh, an NGO, an advocacy NGO on the energy subsector. You're most welcome, Mr. Kamujisha. Uh, thank you. Good evening, listeners. Uh, Honorable Minister, talk, what is the latest news from the oil industry? Uh, the latest news in the oil industry now is that we are embarking on the production phase of our uh, development program. Uh, there has been exploration now because of the discoveries we have made. We want to say we are now oil testing, that is uh, trying to understand the flow of uh, oil fields, whether they communicate or they don't, so that, so, so that we understand which is this resurface, how does it be. Then we are also getting plans now to embark on development, developing these uh, uh, discoveries. Uh, in the development phase, you are trying to draw plans on how you will be able to produce uh, the oil for the oil market. That involves the laying of infrastructure and so on. This is a heavy job, but we have started on it. And what can we expect before the end of this year? Uh, before the end of this year, you see the, pro the process is long. We shall be expecting to be told that uh, we have got Section B finished, and then we are trying to get, of course, we have told you, um, maybe through papers, that we are also trying to get a oil uh, refinery. In instead of transporting our oil, which is works in, in pipes, to the coast, which is not very uh, cheap, the uh, government of Uganda thought it wise and has opened done a study that is cost effective to have a refinery here. So the refinery area we have identified and that's why we want to put all this infrastructure to lead, especially the pipes, to lead our oil to the refinery for processing. All right, we'll talk a little bit more about that refinery. Mr. Kabanda, you have a lot of experience in the industry, more than 20 years. Talk to us about the necessary laws. Do we have the necessary laws? Uh, thank you, Edmund. Um, uh, about the laws, we are currently using uh, the Petroleum Exploration and Production Act, CAP 150, the laws of Uganda, uh, to manage uh, the sector. That's the Milton of Bottle of 1985. <laughs> <laughs> uh, call it that, but uh, uh, it has been a very good uh, law that we have used to manage uh, the sector up to today, but uh, we realized that uh, more than it is, it is a long. It's an old law, uh, which uh, does not cover some of the latest technology. And we therefore, uh, through the National Oil and Gas Policy that was approved by Cabinet in 2008, we realized that we needed to update aspects of this law. And uh, it is in this effect that uh, a bill, uh, two bills, are currently before uh, Parliament, 
and these bills were prepared in order to uh, meet the shortcomings that the current law uh, has with regard to a management of uh, this sector. So uh, maybe I would just like to give you a background as to the formulation process of these bills because uh, some people think that these bills have just been developed overnight, but the process of formulating these bills starts way back uh, as uh, 2008 when the National Oil and Gas Policy was approved by Cabinet and uh, a working group uh, which constituted, which was uh, uh, constituted uh, involving ministries of justice and constitutional affairs, ministries of finance, minister of energy and mineral development uh, was put together, together uh, and worked with our external consultants, uh, a Norwegian company, to put together uh, draft bills and these draft bills were shared with first uh, the stakeholders within the government and then we went out and shared these with uh, stakeholders that are outside government and uh, it is from these stakeholders that we have we had we had we got a lot of comments and uh, these comments have been addressed uh, and they come out into the bills that are currently before uh, parliament all right <coughs> like, we'd like we'd like to get some more details from you about this these bills the two bills before the uh, of course against the context the backdrop of the national oil and gas policy which has been commended as an excellent document we'll talk about about that in a short while. Mr. Kamjisha, are the oil companies in your view complying with the normal standards? <clears throat> of course, uh, thank you very much. And uh, if you look at what the government has been doing, of course, as the, the minister and uh, Fred said, uh, we've been using a law that was enacted in 1985 when we had not discovered any oil. So any commercial deposits of oil? Commercial yes, yes, commercial deposits, because if it is not commercial, definitely we would not be spending a lot of time on it. So that law has been, has been in place and it is the one we've been using. So if you say whether companies have been complying or not complying, they have been complying with that law. Because if they are not complying, then definitely we would have chased them away. The government has the powers within its laws. But that law has been a bad law. Because if you look at, I think the government will tell you since 2006, you had Energy Africa, you had Adman Resources, you had the Heritage, you had now Taro. All those companies have been exchanging, sell, th selling their shares to each other. And they've been making a lot of money in terms of profits on capital assets. But our laws were not really sufficient enough to make sure that we capture some of those profits. In uh, 2010, when we attempted to get uh, taxes from Heritage, we definitely, we ended up now in courts in London, new courts in Uganda. So if a law is a good law, it will not provide for those uncertainties where you need to go to courts because the court expenses are too much and uh, you will spend a lot of money and you are not so sure whether you will win or not. So for me, I think in terms of registration, while the government has been doing a lot of work to make sure that we continue with the development of the sector, in terms of the registration, we have to admit that we are too late and there are things that will not be actually rectified by the new rules that we are putting in place. And of course, the government can also tell you where Uganda discovered oil, oil later after we had already discovered they, already they, they are they producing <coughs> and I'm very sure we also want money but because we have not organized our sector very well so we cannot produce and I'm not encouraging government to produce in a hurry uh, to make things bad but if we are efficient enough to make sure that the systems are put in place then we should start producing but because we cannot do that we cannot produce but at the same time if we have calculate how much we have lost I think recently you you saw how uh, parliament was passing resolutions demanding for the laws why because the government was br not bringing those bills so now that the bills have been presented to parliament there are only two bills you don't have the revenue management i think they are recently they said it was also presented in parliament but no one actually wants to tell you about that bill and i'm very sure you know every ugandan would want to know where the the revenue management management bill is because if you don't know how you are going to use the how you are going to use the revenues even the little money that we are demanding from the companies the capital gains tax that we are demanding from the companies we can get it and we may fail to use it so at the end of it all i don't think that the government has been moving the Session has, has been moving at the speed the, the, the industry has been developing, and for that matter, there are things that we are we cannot really benefit. We can the, the public can benefit, and the, in a way, we've lost some of the opportunities. 
Well, listen, this is Spectrum on Radio 1 tonight. Tracking developments in the oil and gas <coughs> sector. What is the latest on the much anticipated resource? Our guests tonight, Honorable Peter Lokeris, Minister of State for Mineral Development, Mr. Fred Kabanda, Principal Geologist at the Petroleum Exploration and Production Department. And Mr. Dickens Kamjisha, Executive Director of Fiego, that's the Af African Institute for Energy Governance. You will be able to contribute to this discussion at some stage. Honorable Minister, can you give us a timeline between now and the time we begin to see oil flowing? Oh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, you see, we have said that we are anticipating to get uh, a refinery. We have also told you that we have just got the land. It is being surveyed, and we are trying to quantify how many people we have to pay. How much is we, the land we, again? We have, it is 29 square kilometers. Square kilometers yes. It is going to house uh, many infrastructure. It is going to house an airport, which will be bringing things there for construction of the finance, not a small project. We are also reserving some parts for anticipated petrochemical industries which will follow the products which come out uh, from the, the refinery. Of course the white oil will be sold, but we have got other residual uh, products that will be processed there which will bring us plastics and so on. This is just really a multiplier effect. So we are saying that if we have to look at the refinery, already we have got the, the feasibility study of refinery and the recommended configurations, types of the uh, refineries that are required. If you want the one which is producing a smaller, producing about 20,000 uh, yes. barrels per day, yes. you are talking about two and a half years. If you are getting down of 60, uh, depending on who you choose, who the contractor is, uh, it is three, three to five years uh, there. That is when you will see the oil, which is white oil, because we have opted for refinery. And in fact, the feasibility study shows that uh, the cost benefit is very, is very good, verifiable indeed, because we are in the center of Africa. In, in fact, we are landlocked, and therefore we shall pass, we shall pass of all, um, satisfy our own local needs yes. for the country. We shall move to regional needs. That is part of even the Sudan, still even if it has oil, it has to export it. It will yes. go out, but they have not opted for refinery. Yes. So therefore, they could, we, they could also, some of them could also buy our oil. We are thinking of Rwanda, we are thinking of Burundi, we are thinking of part of Tanzania. In fact, the, the, market, the market, and then the Congo, the Eastern Congo, uh, the market is uh, good enough for us, according to the study. So those, that's the timelines that we are giving you. Now that we are in the pro, um, uh, preparation, to produce, that is laying the pipes, checking, the, um, I mean, testing the, the flows of our oils. All those things are stages towards the production phase. And uh, but of course, we do, this oil cannot be consumed all in the region. It's still like when, when you're producing that peak capacity, 200 barrels per day, you can't sell it all in the region. You need to export it. Shall we have a pipeline to the sea? Well, in the first place, uh, if we think that we have made many discoveries with the rate we have now. Uh, our discoveries are estimated at 2.5 uh, million barrels uh, available. But the recovery rate that we can get out of that, you can't get all of it out of uh, the ground. It, it is the coverage about 1.1 1. 1 Yeah, about 1 billion, 1 billion, 1 billion, one billion barrels. barrels. That is what we anticipate out of this. But this one here, the discovery we have made, it is covering a potential area of 40%. We still think that we have another area to be uh, explored of about 60%. And who will make successful discoveries at the rate we are making? Then it means our quantity now of barrels to be recovered in a number of years will be much higher. So therefore, uh, we, we at this rate we don't think we shall step up to 200 barrels, 200,000 uh, barrels per day. We are still starting with 20, and if we think we should go fast, we should go just 60. And this out of this, we think we shall be able to consume this. But if the country discovers a lot, still you can lay a pipe up to the coast and you export some. All right, Mr. Kavanda, could you talk to us what people can expect as we move towards commercial production? Uh, yes, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Edmund. But before I go to what people should expect, I thought I would uh, make some clarification on uh, uh, what my colleague here, Dickens, talked about uh, with regard to having good laws 
that we will not let people go into courts of law. My thinking is a good, what he classifies as a bad law is not true because you would like to have a law or a system which allows people to go into uh, courts of law where they are not satisfied. And that's what is happening with regard to the aspects of uh, uh, arbitration. Yes. But I would also like to make it clear that the laws we are talking about are resource management laws. And they will therefore not be able to indicate what taxes would should be uh, should be made to whoever is selling. Yes. Uh, he cites some examples of some African countries which are producing uh, now, yet they made discoveries later on, later than us. Yeah. Uh, my thinking is we need to set priorities. As Uganda, we have our priority being resource management. And in order for you to have good resource management, you need good laws to be put in place with regard to resource management. Yes. Other countries can produce without laws, and we have seen examples in Africa, which are using mining laws in order to produce petroleum. Yes. We have also seen countries here in Africa which go into production as soon as they have a resource manage a, a revenue management law. So in other words, for them they put in front the revenues. Yes. For us we would like to put in front of us aspects that relate to resource management rather than talking about uh, the aspects of 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 of, of, of uh, production and therefore uh, the monies. We are currently just to add on to what the Honorable uh, Minister talked about with regard to production. We are currently uh, preparing for production. And when I say preparing for production, I mean uh, like commercial production. Because during appraisal, and appraisal uh, may not be clear to many of our listeners, but appraisal basically means if you have made a discovery, you would like to define the extent of that discovery. Yes. And in that case, you would need to drill a number of wells, and in order to test what you have found, you sometimes are required to produce and test these reservoirs. So we have had what we call extended well testing, production of crude from these reservoirs coming to the surface. Uh, in the past, we used to burn this crude. However, with our new policy, we would like to promote maximum utilization of the natural sources. And so we asked the companies not to flare or to burn any of this crude yes. anymore. And currently, we have had four wells tested. 28,000 uh, barrels of crude have been captured, have been produced. And these are stored in the fields. Yes. Uh, for uh, those of uh, the listeners who have been to the field, the oil is containerized, it's put in beauty tainers. And the 28,000 barrels is about 38 million liters of this crude. This crude would like to sell, and maybe you can allow me to make an advert here. Please that go on. We are selling this crude, and we would like customers, companies that are using heavy fuel oil, to be able to come in. For what? For generation of yes, for, electricity, for, for instance? For, yes, for like factories that are using furnaces, right. uh, and are able to, those that are generating electricity, would like to call upon them to come and see this crude, because they can use this crude to replace their HFO. The challenge we have had is it solidifies at room temperature. But the beauty tainers where it is stored are able to be heated up and it will come, uh, come into liquid form again. So we would like to call upon those the companies that are able to utilize it to come and talk to us about utilizing this. The other project that we are doing in order to plan for production is a project we are calling the Integrated Power Project. Yes. We have got, we have got gas that has been discovered at one of the fields, Nzizi field. We have undertaken studies in order to be able to utilize this gas to produce electricity. This is a, uh, a plant that we are talking about 50 megawatts of electricity to be generated from gas, but 
it that's will a large, be a large size. Yes, that's a large size, and we are talking about utilizing this gas, but also having the engines dual in nature, such that in case you do not have enough gas to be able to produce 50 megawatts at any one time, you should be able to use crude, to use heavy fuel oil in order to generate this uh, project, this electricity. And that is the reason. That's a complex unit, isn't it? Not really very complex. The end, like energy generators, but in this case you, it would be a dual generator. Yes. Being able to use two Gas sources. Then, of, yes. Right, okay. Uh, and that's why this project is actually located near the refinery location because we would like to uh, use this uh, project for a long term and when the refinery is in place the heavy fuel that comes out of this refinery should be able to feed into this project for a continuous process so I thought I would add those aspects that uh, have been uh, undertaken as we go into uh, production All right. could you give us an overview of what is likely what people in the communities can expect Yes, the people in the communities are actually already getting a lot of uh, the benefits. But in addition to that, we would, we would want to extend the benefits that are being given to the communities where the companies are operating to the nation. And in that regard, a study has been uh, undertaken. This study is uh, on enhancement of the national participation in the oil and gas sector. Yes. The study uh, was uh, paid by our ministry with support from uh, the Norwegian government. This was an expensive uh, study, but we have put it up onto our website free of charge for Ugandans to be able to access this. Yes. And everybody can access this report at our website www.petroleum.go.ug. Yes. And uh, they made some recommendations with regard to uh, what we could do in order to enhance participation of Ugandans, uh, but we have gone a step further. And we are now, we advertised recently in the uh, media uh, for a company that will work with us in developing strategies in order to implement this study. We got very many bids and the selection process is ongoing, but as soon as this is done, we intend to expand that study in order to create more opportunities for Ugandans. But I cannot uh, stop at talking about this project without talking about education. One of the key aspects in the sector is that the sector requires people who know the subject. And in this regard, government has been training its own staff, but it is expensive to train this. I think one Master of Science degree in petroleum costs between 30 to 50,000 US dollars. It's almost so that's it's a lot of money, it's a lot of money. Yes. yes. So what we did as government was to bring the services nearer to the people. And so we worked with Makerere University to bring courses here on petroleum geoscience and production. And the, fa the, the first lot is in the third year now. It's a four-year course in Makerere University. We also realized that the jobs in the industry will not only be for graduates, because we did a study. And in this study, it was realized that many of the jobs would be for technicians and artisans. Welders. Yes. And so in that regard, government, on its own funding, put up the Uganda Petroleum Institute in Chigumba. The intention was to produce people who can be employed in the sector and would like high-class people. And that's why government has spent a lot of money training these people. The first lot is currently in Trinidad and Tobago yes. for industrial training. Right. And when they return, we expect that the first lot of 30 people would uh, have to be recruited in the sector. All right, this is Spectrum on Radio 1 tonight. Tracking developments in the oil and gas sector. What is the latest on the much anticipated resource? We are going for a break. When we come back, we'll get uh, some, uh, the minister to talk to us about. Uh, this bill, details of the bill, what exactly is entailed in it, and uh, whether government really, really wants to be transparent about the money and other things, the processes. We'll be back after this break. When Junior lost his appetite, his mother tried all methods to get him to eat. She tried scary stories. Eat, Tommy, eat, or the big black elephant will come and eat all your food. Mm -mm. She tried magic. Tommy, if you eat your food, I will turn this handkerchief into sweets. Look, bumble, bumble, boom, boom. Mm -hmm. 
then she discovered apatol multivitamin syrup with lysine mommy i finished all the food i am number one apatol multivitamin with lysine is helping mothers to turn mealtime frustration to a fun moment apatol has a great taste and contains lysine which quickly improves your child's appetite and supports healthy growth apatol help for life Join Airtel today and get 50% bonus airtime instantly. That's right, 50% bonus airtime to call across all networks. <laughs> Simply buy and register a new Airtel SIM card. Top up 1,000 shillings and more and 50% bonus airtime to call across all networks is yours. Join Airtel today. Get bonus today. Airtel. John, Mike and I, we go back a bit. We knew John at the beginning, working for someone else. But he was different. He had vision, saw opportunities. He started working towards his goal, opened his own garage and worked, learning the hard way. His reputation spread, trust, consistency, quality. Soon people were coming to him from all parts. He made himself and his whole street prosper and also helped friends seeing potential in people and helping them on. But John never shouts about all his success. He is just who he is. Special. So here's to men like John who make a difference, who enjoy Nile Special. The rich, satisfying taste from the sauce. Nile Special. You've earned it. Not for sale to persons under 18. Spectrum on Radio 1 FM 90. Welcome back. And on Spectrum tonight, tracking developments in the oil and gas sector. What is the latest on the much anticipated resource? Our guests tonight on our uh, Honorable Peter Lokeris, Minister of State for Mineral Development, Mr. Fred Kabanda, Principal Geologist at the Petroleum Exploration and Production Department, and Mr. Dickens Kamjisha, Executive Director of the, Af uh, the African Institute for Energy Governance, or FIECO. You will be able to call in and contribute to this discussion. Honorable Minister, can you give us, uh, of course, he raised the Mr. Kamjisha from the NGO sector. Let's uh, raise some points. That I'd like you to respond to, but specifically, would you like to talk to us about uh, details of these bills? What is in there, and uh, how compliant they are to the national land gas policy? Okay, first of all, these bills are separated into three as we have said. The two are being shepherded by us, the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development, and that is the upstream, uh, upstream uh, bill which talks about production, preparation, testing, and so on. Then there is now the other bill, which is production conversion of, of, of the products that we have got, and that's, you talk about the refinery, the laying of pipes. So all these things contain the nitty gritties on how to go about all these processes so that you are, you look, you are efficient. Then when you go now to the one which is for refining, of course I've already told you when you are going to refine, you must bring the products here, you will take them someplace. Then when you are cracking, the size of, they talks about the size of the refinery, then when you are cracking, what components will you get? Do you want to bring crude and only get two components, maybe jet oil and then petrol, or you want to bring other finer products of oil types? that you want to, to have. So these things are explained there, and they are all derived from uh, our policy, which we made, uh, passed to the one you say defunct, that one of uh, the, the one before 2003. Uh, and, uh, and the 1985. So, the, the 1985. In fact, that thing is not defunct. It only talked about the commercialization aspect, because there was no upstream, because we didn't discover anything. There was no midstream either. It was just to say you transport it liquid up to here and distribute to different points. That's what that one was talking about. Then when we got this policy now, it was recognizing that there is already existence of oil here. You now to talk, you must talk about the development of oil, uh, oil wells. You must now talk about if you want a refinery. That's why this one is more detailed on aspects which the other one didn't contain. And that's why we had to make it. And also to talk about how will Ugandans benefit from this discovered baby and that's why we have the oily, the oily, I mean the contents now we are talking about we are to train people on handling the production processes because we are the one that's now of this and the oil itself underground is all in the province of government 
All right. Of course, we'd like to talk to you. We'd like to ask you to talk, talk to us about uh, how the money is going to be shared. But before we do that, Mr. Kamjisha, what do you see as the bottlenecks to progress? What's holding things back? I think for me, in my opinion, there are a number of things, especially the government. If you hear the, the government's speech, is actually a wonderful one. But if you see the practical part of it, I think we are actually not doing it, walking the talk. So, because I think if we want to be transparent, you would begin with especially the, oil pro the production sharing agreements. These are these, the uh, production sharing agreements. Are, it's there are documents that actually define the rights and obligations of our, of the companies that are operating here, that define the rights of the government of Uganda. But these are documents they have decided to keep secret. Yes, Even to members of parliament, they decided to give guidelines that actually make it completely you difficult. Photocopy them. You can't photocopy. You are supposed to be watched while you are reading as an uh, MP. But this is the parliament that is supposed to make laws. And the laws must be in harmony with the agreements. The, and agreements, that's the agreements must be in harmony with the laws. No, the fact that now the agreements are already in place. The, the, the laws must though. be in, agreement with, in, in, in harmony with the agreements because you are not going to make retrospective laws. And that's why I was... Uh, I think for Fred, when he said that we we are trying to move slowly in terms of making laws so that we don't rush. You know, when you commit yourself in these agreements, I tell you the companies will take you on. So if you don't you don't have you have not set your legal standards, the the agreements are the ones the companies are going to use against you. And indeed we are in courts. So if we can't show them that actually we have the right laws, whether they are taxation laws, whether they are development laws, it is going to be hard for us. So for for me, I think the progress that we should be talking about is the political will to make sure that the sector is run transparently. And the, especially now, if you look at the content of the laws, that the, the bills that are in place, you can't even believe that even these bills don't have a time frame within which they are going to be enacted into laws. Yes. Because the parliament also demanded from government in October last year that the laws, should, the bills should be presented in a month. Now they are not happen. Now almost it, yeah, they did not happen. Even the government went ahead to enter into other agreements and give licenses to Taro in the respect of Kingfisher, Kanyataba. Of course, that was against the, par the parliamentary resolutions. And in my opinion, if you want to show that you are a government and you want to be transparent, you want to ensure that Ugandans really respect and trust what you are doing, you must make sure that what you are doing is really in line with what Ugandans are asking for. But I think those are examples where you see we are not doing well. I think the, the refinery, I think that's an area where all of us as Ugandans, the government either is going to make it right and ensure that Ugandans are behind it, Ugandans trust it, or Ugandans actually keep on saying you are doing the wrong things, you are trying to con conspire with companies against the interests of Ugandans, because we've been asking. You have the feasibility study? And the, the government, in a way, has decided to build a refinery. Yes, it is a good thing to build a refinery. Yes. But what are the risks that you have taken into account to say a refinery is a good product, is going to give us value for money? Because there are a number of things that you'll be looking at. Yes. Our capacity to build a refinery, how much money are we going to spend? Well, I, I think after, the, the, after the, the, the promoters have put down $10 billion for the entire industry, $10 no, billion dollars for the uh, refinery. No, of course, of course, I think we want to get it from our own government. I don't think that Ugandans are going to be relying on companies, what they are telling. Well, they have committed themselves to the government, who are now part, they are, they're now in partnership. No, they have put down $2 billion dollars out of 10. I think, Edmund, there is nowhere in this world where the companies are going to be giving you the truth. I think our companies, and I think we have these experts, they need to be telling the, 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 the Ugandans that this is what we are doing, and this is what it is. So that for us as, as, as Ugandans, we can hold them accountable, but if it is a company telling me it is a, 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 a refinery is two billion and it ends up being five billion. Of course, that would be poor planning. So, and I think for me, what I would be asking the, the, the company, the government, to do is that they are able to tell Ugandans the, we are building a refinery. We have the capacity to produce at the efficient, uh, at the maximum efficiency level. We are going to produce these products. We are capable of marketing these products. Whether we take them in Nairobi, in Chigali, in Burundi, we are able to market them and ensure that they compete with other products. Yes. But to have that illusion that, you know, we are going to sell in the regional markets. 
you are not going to stop other other countries to bring on the regional market. But we see what is it that we've been doing as a country to make sure that actually we can compete. I think we have not been doing well because even the hydro and skills and those are examples you can use whether you can be efficient or not. Of course, when we are talking about refinery, I think we are talking of relying on the companies. And I think in some cases, I think uh, one you will see, in some cases, especially like our dams, if you see China Dam, the company deceived us that actually the dam was going to produce a lot of electricity. We right. ended up with uh, an empty dam. Okay. Mr. Commander. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I think... Uh, you need to hold a lot of these talk shows such that I educate my colleague on some of the aspects that are ongoing in the industry. Go on. <laughs> the people in the field, actually, we hold regular talk shows in Hoima, Masindi, and Kagadi. And so those people are more informed than uh, uh, some of people our in the colleagues. Country. Yes. But uh, I think I need to make some clarification on two aspects. One, the refinery. He wants us to put money for the refinery and then we go forward. I think it has been said over and over again that it's true we do not have uh, the technical know-how, neither do we have the money, the money to undertake this uh, refinery on our own. However, what we have done is we do not make guesses. We make decisions that are informed. An informed decision comes through studies. We had many arguments with the companies on is it feasible to export or is it feasible to refine. We decided to put money as government and a detailed study, a feasibility study was undertaken on refining in country. The economics was uh, done very well and we do not stop anybody from importing. But we are uh, in this study have done uh, like cost benefits analysis. How much would it cost you to bring in the product and how much would you sell when it's here? And so all these studies have pointed towards a cheaper option of refining in the country to produce these products. And because we are, do not have the capability, we are going for PPP. Public we, partnership. That's true. We would like to cost uh, to share the costs with these companies, and government will be a partner in this development. And one of the first things we have done is, in order not to stop the processes, we have acquired the land. The honourable minister, the square, kilometers. square kilometers. The honourable minister was talking about, and this is a foundation. We are not about to stop. We shall now go on to the next phases. We are in the process of acquiring an advisor yes. on how we should take this forward, this uh, procurement forward of uh, procuring a partner to come and work with the government to deliver this refinery. And so uh, studies are important. We have also just finished a study on how will the crude be transported from the different fields onto the refinery location. Yes. And so this is a study that is coming from the technical aspects and we are ready to put money okay. and not go into guessing aspects but allow me to also talk about the law very briefly yes briefly he talked about the laws that are hindering progress i have to uh, say here and, and now that the law we are currently using, the 1985 law, does not stop any work from going on. Yes. We have not reached any gaps with regard to the activities that are currently ongoing. You still cover, whatever activity you are undertaking is covered by the current law. Yes, and uh, one of the things that uh, was actually done was the issuance of a production license over the Kingfisher. We have set out in this current law things that one must do in order to qualify for production license. And one of the things is field development plans. Yes. These are actually un uh, being undertaken now, being prepared by the oil companies. But for Kingfisher, those were prepared and discussed with government. We are also undertaking a lot of work in the field. Currently, as I speak here, we are drilling four wells at the moment. Yes. Appraise three appraisal wells and one exploration well. These are being undertaken in the current law as it is. Okay. We are acquiring uh, uh, gravity surveys using low uh, <coughs> flying air, 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 air aircrafts. And all these will lead into appraisal and presentation of field development plans before we issue any production license. So I would also uh, like, therefore, to say here that it is important that as we look at the new bills, 
they should not be looked at some go as golden plates that have just arrived from Paris. We need to look at them and compare with the what was in the old law, yes. what has been put in here, and uh, where has the second, the other option, where have the other additions come from? And many of the other aspects have actually come from uh, the uh, the PSAs that we had. All right. We would like to not to negotiate a lot of PSAs in future. We are picking out most of the things and putting them in the uh, current bill. All right. Well, let's hear from the listeners. But before we do that, Honourable Minister, talk to us about transparency and how this money is going to be split. How much goes to the Kingdom of Bonyoro? Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, this is a resource for all Ugandans and uh, the production share sharing agreements contain some of this because all, even these have elements derived from the laws, existing laws. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that production sh sharing agreements for all companies are not the same. When we started, when we didn't know that the oil was there, the companies could threaten and say, we are pulling out. We know there is no way. Now there. you know you have it. So you are a little bit uh, shaky and uh, doing this. All right. But as we discovered the way, there is a rush by these people. And we are also dictating somehow. Because when you have something, you don't shake. Yes. So we are, in fact, these things are being progressively modified. If okay. you look at different laws, which uh, my friend is saying that they are there in parliament, and even when the member of parliament is reading, there is a, a policeman <laughs> standing, <laughs> standing <laughs> near, I don't know, I okay. couldn't read if there was a policeman, because I, I know uh, we, we have given these laws to parliament, okay. and there's no problem. So, uh, there is what they call realities. Yes. This production sharing agreement is good. That is one a type, a type of uh, sharing resources. In fact, there are four types, but we chose production sharing agreement because of its merits. Yes. This one provides that you can share in terms of royalties. Okay. Royalties means you make a, 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 a value of reduction outright okay. from the oil when it is crude. This one you can, according to ours, okay. we are giving to government some percentage. I, I would yes. like to know about, because I like to hear from the listeners, but Bunyoro, the kingdom. The yes, kingdom the kingdom, the king, the, the kingdom as much? of now, it depends on the law, but now the, there is what they call, the kingdom is not now the a government by its own. That is accounting government. You can see the district. It is accounting. Then you will see the local government. So what's the plan? How, how, is the plan? how will it be split? So it is split like this. One, there is a percentage going to the district concern. How much? Uh, you see, you cannot say it now <laughs> because the laws have not been... The, <laughs> figures, are, the figures are there. Let's but I, can, I cannot say it now because All right. they are in parliament. Okay. So even the parliamentarians can uh, <laughs> modify and say not this figure. It must be this figure. <laughs> so the Otherwise it is there. Has to, then, you, has to wait. then now you continue. No, it's not waiting. Okay. I'm saying it is considered. Let's hear from this now. I'll have to show the Honorable Minister. All right. All right. This is Spectrum on Radio 1 tonight. Tracking developments in the oil and gas sector. What is the latest on the much anticipated resource? You can call in now. Our number is 0414-348-111-0312-260-390-0312-261390. When you call in, please tell us your name and uh, where are you calling from? Spectrum, hello? 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 Yes, sir, your name? Yes, I love it.
Spectrum, hello. Uh, good evening. Good evening, your name, sir? Yeah, Edmond, you know the name, just by the studio. Yes. Spectrum, hello. Hello, good evening. Good evening. Good evening your name? I'm on board here. Yes, Peter. Okay, we'll we'll get back to the street. Okay, one final call. Spectrum, hello. Yes, good evening, good morning. Good evening, your name? Uh, Deo Mutawazi. Yes, Deo. Let's start with the Honorable Minister. Well, I, I would like to start with the, the sharing bit. Uh, thank you very much for raising that one. You see, in the, in the laws, there are what they call royalties. These royalties are shared between the government and local governments of the area. <coughs> there is the, the, what they call cost recovery. We have already got amounts which companies inject plus government. That will also be a certain percentage recoverable over a number of years. There is what they call profit oil. This is now the last stage. This profit oil is divided between the company and the government. In the first few years, the companies take higher percentage. Progressively as you go, because they are recovering their, their capital which they injected in, then the amount of government rises until after a number of years the government to get more. So Uganda stands to benefit in every case. Then of course uh, this one of hydropower that is not well managed. But this one will be well managed. We are saying that this one will put appropriate laws. Right. We have already read other laws from countries which manage this thing efficiently. And we have imported these laws here. This is what the parliament will pass. So, my technocrat will handle the rest. All right, Mr. Commander. Okay, thank you very much. Very quickly, um, on uh, refinery being a gamble. And I think that's what I said. We would like to avoid gambling. And uh, we can only avoid gambling by using technical methods, studies. And the study that I talked about it clearly outlines what is the break-even price for a refinery of a different size. Because when we talk about a refinery, we must also talk about the capabilities, the sizes, and the technical... This is a small one, 2 billion. Uh, it's about 2 billion, but we are talking about... Uh, 60,000 barrels of oil per day, but because of the time it will take, we are also looking at bringing in a modular kind of uh, refinery so One that can start be upgraded. 20,000, mm -hmm. which can be upgraded. Right. So there is no way we could uh, have uh, done studies that uh, break even at 150 barrels of oil per day. Scenarios were put in this study. $150. $150. Uh, I think the working price is $75. About 30 40 break even. 
Right. So it is that low, and right. it is very profitable because you return your investment in three years. But details of this study can be acquired from our department. They Talk about the oil refinery because they gave a figure ten to twenty billion dollars. It's much too high. Normally, a big a big refinery is about eight billion dollars. I think. Uh, yes, it depends on the complexity of the refinery because if you have a lot of sulfur in your oil, then you need a lot of equipment to remove the sulfur. In our case, we have zero sulfur, so that brings down the cost of the, the, cost of the refinery. Right. Uh, he also, uh, there is uh, Jimmy. Jimmy asked about does this oil go beyond this regime? I would like to say here that. Uh, when we are looking at oil, we are looking at oil in a long-term uh, process, and right. the production licenses we issue are 25 years plus five-year renewable process. All right. Uh, maybe just to uh, very briefly, uh, very briefly comment on uh, the aspects of how will the oil resources be better managed? No, that's it. Go to <coughs> our, our, our regime. Forty years. Mm. Yeah, people <laughs> might keep. <laughs> the waters might keep returning the same regime. So yes. we leave that. We leave that. I, I leave that I like it. Mm. We, we, we shall be. We shall appreciate. Yes, yes. but on oh no, how will this oil sector be managed better? I think we have already started. Yes. We put together the National Oil and Gas Policy mm -hmm. for Uganda. Yes. This policy was put in place after a very wide consultative process. And many people think it's an excellent document. And so this is the question, right? That's, that's the starting okay. point. Our time is uh, uh, Mr. Kamjisha. Jimmy Mugaro has been appointed to head Talo Uganda operations. Does it make things better for you and everybody else? No, I really don't think that that makes things better because at the end of the day we are not looking at individuals. We look at well, this. We look at Uganda. We look at the system. No, you You've been having uh, Eric Kamanga as chairman of Taro, but uh, recently the government was uh, forcing Taro to pay the taxes that were supposed to be paid by heritage. So, at the end of the day, as a country, we cannot look at what individuals. But last I just wanted to talk about the sharing. I think the reason why the Bunyoro people are saying they want to share. This is not to say that oil is for Bunyoro, but I think as a, as a country we have to discuss with those people. Why are they asking for a share? What does, uh, what do we need to make sure that actually those people support the industry, those people so they are peaceful? They own it. I think uh, we also Perfect. need to look at that one because the, the Mining Act provided for some money to the landowners, provided for, uh, for some money to the districts. I'm wondering why oil you are saying. No, it is following the same path. No, and I, I think that's what you need to Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, But the last thing was about the peasants. I think, Fred, you can say that the peasants know better than us. <laughs> <laughs> It's not happening in the past. It's probably one. Well, Africa, thank you very yeah, much. Well, Adi, I guess. Honorable Peter Lokeris, Minister of State for Mineral Development, thank you for coming tonight, sir. Mr. Fred Kiwanda, Principal Geologist at the Petroleum, Ex Petroleum Exploration and Production Department with a long CV, over 20 years in the industry. Thank you for coming to Spectrum. You are welcome. Mr. Dickens Kamjisha, Executive Director of uh, the African Institute for Energy Governance of Higo. Thank you for tuning in. I've been your host, Edmond Chisito. Spectrum will be back tomorrow. Up next is the news in English. Thank you. Ooh, 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 ooh,